Hello, and welcome to Jurassic Park. Oh wait, no. Hello and welcome to episode 3 of the 5th week event. Yeah, I'm pretty excited for the new movie too. I grew up with dinosaurs, dino riders, the first Jurassic Park, so of course I am totally waiting to see this movie. I couldn't go opening night, but I will probably be going by the time you hear this. But this week we won't be talking about dinosaurs. Again, we will be talking about RPGs, but this week we will be talking about superhero RPGs. Specifically, the superhero RPG I played, the Marvel game. We only called it the Marvel game, although we did play several games set in the Marvel Universe, because this one ended up being epic. This was also the one where I first created Warwick. Yes, Warwick was the first character in the Descendants Universe, and this game is pretty much the catalyst for the Descendants Universe. And I felt like... Now that I'm doing the podcast and I can actually ramble on, you know, instead of having to write the whole thing down, I can finally do it justice in explaining to you just how this game inspired everything. So without further ado, let's start with a little bit of backstory. At the time that I was asked to be in this game, I was what you would call a lapsed comic book fan. I had been a big fan throughout high school. I this was this was during the speculator boom, but you could still buy comic books at the grocery store or uh, at the, on the corner corner ends. At I think it was um, this place called AIDS. Yes, there was a store called AIDS. A I D E S. Um, that was where I my family did a lot of shopping, and uh, they actually had a comic rack. And I was really into the X-Men, uh, they had a series of X-Men comics that was based around the animated series, which was in turn based around Chris Claremont's run on the series. So I was a big fan of that, but that ended and I started trying to read the main X-Men stuff. The problem was, it, they did this event called Onslaught. Onsla- Onslaught then led into another event called Heroes Reborn. What happened was, the brain baby of Professor Charles Xavier and Magneto, which is this psychic entity called Onslaught, decided to kick everyone's ass and appeared to kill all the non-mutant heroes of the Marvel Universe. And instead they were actually sent into this pocket dimension called the Heroes Are Born Universe, and it annoyed the hell out of me. It was such, even as a teenager, it was such a blatant, stupid gimmick that I just, I, I just stopped buying. So, I hadn't bought comics for about five, five or six years, when, I think it was around 2005, um... A friend of my, mine, the same guy that ran the uh, the Wraith game that uh, Pele and I ruined, and I, I want to stress because maybe I made him look a little bad last time. He was not a bad GM or storyteller for Wraith. He was he was very good at what he did. It was just that Wraith was not the game that you introduced to people after telling us what he told us about World of Darkness. So I want to stress that because this game. The, the Marvel game that he ran was amazing. So anyway, we get to the, um, he t- talks to me, he's like, yeah, I'm thinking of doing a superhero game. How, what do you think of superhero games? I'm like, oh, that's kind of awesome. You know, I always liked the X-Men. I stopped reading the comics, but I, I've been, uh, <laughs> I've been downloading the, um, the animated series, and I, I watched the X-Men Evolution, so I, I really like X-Men. He goes, well, this is going to be a little different from... This is actually going to be close to the X-Men Evolution. This is based on Academy X. Academy X, and I'll, I'll let you guys know this right off the bat, Academy X was came off of the heels of the Grant Morrison run of the X-Men. And I could say a lot about the Grant Morrison run, both positive and negative, but one of the best things he did was he made mutants an actual racial subculture. They actually had their own little cultures, their own little... They had their own fashion designers. They had their own art and music and 
they were starting to do cinema and all this, and it was great because mutants had always been a have always been a um, an allegory for racism, homophobia, othering in general, and the um, the Grant Morrison thing made them feel like people who were being othered. They didn't just sit there and go, oh, it was me. They still went out and made things and and built their identity about, around who they were. And that was kind of amazing. And you had civilian mutants. There weren't just the X-Men and the Morlocks and the evil mutants anymore. There were just some mutants that were just people. And they were just trying to live their lives. And that was genius. So... Coming off of this, the Xavier School became an actual school for mutants that needed schooling. You know, an actual mutant high school. And, um, so th that's what the game was based on. That's what, uh, New X-Men Academy X was based on. The high school for mutants. What they were doing with the kids who are going to have to grow up as mutants and be productive adults in society. Not necessarily superheroes, but just people in general. And that was a very good way of doing things, and I was very excited to be to be to be brought in on this game. And then he told he told me, Well, here's one thing that might scare you off. I'm doing it in Hero System. And I said, I have no idea what Hero System is and he says, Good, because that might have made you a little skittish to, to play. Apparently, Hero System has this... Well, let me explain what Hero System is. Hero System is sup basically the comprehensive superhero role-playing game. When I say comprehensive, it's designed so that you could, in theory, make any character at their power level without having to fudge things around to make them what they are. And that means it's very complicated. The book... The book is so big, to quote Lewis Black, that if a puma came at me, I could kill it. Yeah, it's a huge book, It's, but it's well worth it, and like I, I keep saying, if you really want to play superheroes, or if you really play, want to play anything that D&D won't allow, or White Wolf won't allow, Hero will let you build it. If you learn Hero you pretty much don't need anything else again. I've heard the same thing of GURPS. I've never played GURPS, so I can't tell you the same thing about that. But Hero, one book will do you for everything. But the thing is, it requires a lot of math to build your powers. Like, when you design your powers, you it's like... When you add extra stuff, it's like times 1.25, times blah, 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 and then you do... Your your disads, which are divided by blank blank blah, blink, blink, blah, and it, it's it is time consuming, but it's worth it. And he was afraid that I was going to be scared off by this, but I was like, no, I I love the fact that I can make anything. And but at the time, he we didn't really have. Um, he was trying to get the game started, so he was like, I will help you build your character. And I always think that's good when you have new players in the system. It's good to, to help them build their character. Uh, some people might wonder why I'm not more like that when I do the do the online games. That's because I think that you got to be fairly close to a person to help them build the character. It, it's I I mean I like you guys, but I I don't want to be that creepy. Uh, "Quote unquote web celebrity that try that thinks that everybody is their pal, you know. I've I've met these people online and they they they're way too overly familiar. So I'm trying to I'm trying to be appropriate with it. So I I answer questions, but I don't go. Well, here's how you do it. But anyway, so he helps me make my character, and I got to give him credit. He he and his suggestions." And questions to me helped form Warwick a lot more than I probably would have on my own, just just sussing out from the hero system. Specifically, he um, my concept was Kid Magneto meets Omega Red. The idea that this this kid was so good with metal that he had these metal tentacles that he could fight with. 
And in Hero, you could basically have made those with just its um, extra limbs. Extra limbs with stretching. And I could have just had a guy that was sort of like, well, he would have also been sort of Kid Doc Ock. But then um, the, this GM, and I'm not using names for people that haven't like been to the site because I don't, I haven't talked to them in a while, so I don't know if they don't, if they want people knowing who they are and what they've done. So he was just the GM for the Marvel game. That's all you're gonna hear. Um, he asked me what may be the turning point question of the character of work. He said, "You know, we could build these on extra limbs and stuff." But you really want to be able to fight with these effectively. You're going to want them to be um, built with this power called Summon. If you've ever wondered why I specifically use the term Summon for Warwick activating Ispen Ospen in the the, uh, book, it's because the power that it's based on was called Summon. And in Hero, Summon is a... You're basically building another character that your character has to take time you know, take an action to bring into play. So, when I was doing it, I said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So they can act independently of me, and I can do the attacks with those while I'm still using my awesome metal powers. So I said, well, the other question is, do you want them to be to be sentient? And I thought for a second, and I went, you know... In the Marvel Universe, mutant powers are very esoteric. You have people that basically, you know, they create energy, they control things. But then you have people that are connected to odd things. Like, there are mutants whose power, is, whose power is that they can control magic. Or Nightcrawler, whose power is that he is connected to this other plane that he can teleport through. So I was like, you know... Warwick could be an elemental. He could be connected to some sort of elemental plane of metal. And that was, you know, that never made it into the sentence because I have the, uh, my no aliens rule. So, Warwick was connected to metal. He had an understanding, a sympathetic understanding of metal, and that's how the tentacles were sentient. So, that that's how Warwick got his iconic sort of abilities. There's also the fact that I found Transform, and Transform is really, really cheap if you have some Transform similar to similar. I was like, okay, I'll turn metals into other metals. And then I looked at the periodic table, and basically every da- every damn metal, uh, I mean, every damn element is basically a metal. It's like most of the periodic table is metal, so I'm like, Wow, if I learn more about this, I can do more things. So yeah, that's how war came into being. But um, I think the thing about RPGs, though, is they're not about just you. They're about cooperative storytelling. So let me tell you a little bit about the other characters I played with. Um, the other players I played with and their characters. First is Fi. I think I've... Uh, Firasha. You've, you, some of you have met her on the forums. She was... Um, you may have also heard the story about this character when I was doing my my role playing war stories. Her character was a girl named Danny. She was a really preppy, sort of stuck up valley girl. She was super materialistic. She she was kind of a bitch to all the all the weird looking mutants and stuff. But she was she was nice at heart. She just didn't understand that she was being a bad person. She had never really known mutants before. So she was a flying speedster. And as it turned out, she was also connected to the Dark Force dimension. And which gave her this super-powered evil side, which we called Dark Danny. And we were always joking that she was going to go Phoenix Saga on us. Not in character, because... Oh, oh my god, you do not joke about Jean Grey in the X-Men universe. Ever. But out of character, we were like, oh, she's going to go dark Danny and, and destroy the world and eat and eat the sun. So, but she was, she was fun. She was, um, she was sort of the, a foil for, for Warwick. And I, I'm very sorry that I'm making it sound sort of egotistical here, but we were all very tightly interconnected in our characters because we, we very much 
those of us who weren't already friends, me and Fi were friends, those of us who weren't already friends forged a, a much closer friendship in playing these characters, and the characters became very interwoven. So Danny was somebody that did not understand how this... She she did not accept that she lived in a superhero universe, and the the call to adventure. She didn't like the call to adventure. So she was very much um, the foil for Warwick in that, that respect. Warwick was like, alright, we're going to have to do this because we're saving people. Like, he had a disadvantage that was heroic impulse. He could not... He had to literally roll a save to stop trying to do something heroic. It was great. So... <laughs> So and she was she was sort of the voice of reason, if we did not take into account that we were in a superhero universe. She was like, "What? No, this is a bad idea. This is stupid. We should get the adults." I'm like, "No, we're 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 the team heroes. We're gonna go do this shit." So that was Danny. Danny was Danny was cool. Um, then we had T. Keon, who was played by uh, one of the DM's friends that we had no hadn't really known until, uh, this game. And, let me tell you, this guy was, may have been one of the best role players that I have ever known. And, he's just an awesome guy. And, and we always found a way to play off of each other. There was another game that Fi ran called Upsadia, where he was this paladin, uh, who was the defector from Decadence from the bad guys. And I was playing a version of Tracer and Red Zekes who had been... He had surrendered and been an advisor for the bad guys until they went too far. So they were coming at this from different different directions. And they were... They were like the best of enemies, but they would still stick up for each other. But anyway, his character was named Tikion, and he was the son of the Black Panther and Storm. And I gotta tell you, I really, really hated that pairing when they did it in Marvel, because it felt like, well, here are two most prominent black people, let's just put them together, because obviously the 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 minorities will automatically fall in love with each other when in proximity. I hated that. I, I, I did not think Storm needed a man, first of all. And I did not think Tikion, I mean, Tikion, T'Challa, uh, the Black Panther, I did not think that he really needed somebody as pow- as physically powerful as him. I thought that he, he really should have been paired with somebody who was very smart. Not that Storm isn't smart, but I think somebody who was very smart but not necessarily super powered. That's how I would have done things with Teach a Law. But anyway, I didn't like the pairing, but but this this guy, I can't I'm, once again I'm not using his name, he made it work. He he really he, this this is another reason that the GM was a, a great GM. He really gave gave us control over our supporting cast, and that let <coughs> Tikion's player really play up how Storm was sort of this kind of a superhero version of a working mother. She was trying to watch out for him while he was over there. Meanwhile, Black Panther was distant, but he still cared, but he really wanted to see his son do things on his own, and Tikion reflected that by wanting to show both his father and his mother that he was worthy and was doing right, which became incredibly funny, because um, in the Academy X, the comics, everyone got split into squads that competed against each other, in training sequences. The same thing happened in the game, and we were left to our own devices to decide who was leader. Warwick decided he wanted to be leader because, of course, he was going to be the lead in his own mental comic book. Tikion wanted to be leader because, well, he was born leader and he was the ki- the king. Yeah, he started out super arrogant, which was fun- hilarious, but uh, we ended up becoming co-leaders, and... <laughs> And they became kind of best friends, despite Tikion's constant, God, you're an idiot, to work. Because they they played off of each other very, very well, and Tikion had electricity powers. 
you know, Storm's kid. Obviously, he has electricity powers. So his electricity powers worked very well with, by combining with the metal with the metal controller to the point where we started taking teamwork uh, skills together so we could work together and it make our effects even cooler when we work together. And again, another great thing about Hero is that you can do that. But um, yeah, so Tikion, Tikion played a huge part in this game. And he even died for a while. He died the superhero t- type of death where he had to come back by having a miniseries off to the side. And that was so badass. Because when he died, Tikion's player took over for GM for a couple of sessions. And that was very, very cool. So, um, that was, that was great. And, um, then we had, um, we had who was the character that was probably my favorite character in the whole game. Her name was Tia. A.K.A. Talon. A.K.A. Little Zerker. Tia was, and I don't want to make this sound like it was uncreative, because it was creative as all hell, but it also fit into the whole superhero milieu. Um, Tia was the alternate universe daughter of Wolverine and Jean Grey. So she had Wolverine's power, Wolverine's berserker, uh, you know, berserker tendencies. And she she straight, she had to roll not to go berserk if she felt she was being made fun of or put in danger. She had the berserker tendencies, but she also had the Phoenix Force trying to come out of her. It was, she was a, she was a time bomb. A ticking time bomb in the party, and everybody knew it. They didn't know exactly, they didn't know about the Jean Grey thing for a very long time, but she had all of Wolverine's strengths, but none of his control. So if she got pissed off, she would go nuts. And, well, luckily she only had the bone claws for a while. So we had to be very wary uh, of Tia. Um, later on, later on, Tia, Tia ended up going home and she was replaced by another character, but mostly, and we did have another, uh, player come in who played an energy manipulator, but most of the big stories were these four characters, so I'm, that's why I'm going to focus on. Um, also, I can't remember the other, uh, the energy manipulator's name. I remember the player's name, but I can't tell you guys that, but, uh. Anyway, so the the game started with, of course, us getting split into our groups, and we, the traditional characters from the comics, the main two student groups, the New Mutants and the Hellions. The Hellions, obviously, being the bad kids of the uh, of the new of the Academy X thing, were um, <laughs> they were there. And we also had a group of characters that were... They were all kind of like the Morlock characters. There was one kid that looked like a vulture and all that. And they were the weird-looking characters. And we didn't pay much attention because... In the X-Men games, you expect some characters to look weird. And that clearly does not mean that they're evil. Because, well, you know, Nightcrawler is there and everything. So you can't just assume they're evil. But So we didn't pay much attention to them. We knew the canon characters, because obviously most of us went out and bought the comics immediately to find out more about these other characters. But we didn't really pay much attention to the NPC class, because we thought they were just there as filler. And if you've listened to my, uh, if you've read my D&D war stories, you know that wasn't true. But anyway, we um, started out, and Warwick, Warwick was a bit dumber, like socially stupid, and he he's socially stupid in the sentence too, but he was a lot more socially stupid in terms of mutants in the game because he thought mutants were awesome, like just your powers are awesome. So he had a lot of moments where he did not understand other people's angst over their powers. He also d- didn't have a lot of uh, a lot of a head for implications about these things. So one of the first things that happened is. A lot of the kids arrive, and they're they're going around Salem Center, which is the town near uh, where the Xavier Institute is. 
and we run into the Hellions group. This is before we're actually split up, but a lot of us met, and we were hanging out, and we ran into the Hellions group, and one of the Hellions characters is a girl named Cecily Kincaid, a.k.a. Mercury. She is actually made of a non-toxic mercury uh, isotope. Uh, isotope. I don't know. I don't think isotope is the right word, but anyway. She's a variant of mercury that's not toxic. Which means she's made of metal. Warwick immediately upon seeing her tells her that her, that her power is awesome and she wanted to, he wanted to know how she got her armor to look like that. You have to remember that Warwick has the ability to form instant armor around himself, so he immediately thought that her, she had she was wearing some sort of armor. Which was dumb on his part, because if he had paid attention, because he has metal sense, he would have known that she was metal through and through. But he thought, he thought before he sensed, so... Then he stops himself, because the DM tells me... Yeah, you, you, you realize that she's completely metal. Like, as she balks at what you just said, you realize she's completely metal. And so I, I work, backs himself up, and goes, Oh, wow, you are, like, you're Mercury all the way through, aren't you? That is so cool. You know, we should hang out, because I control metal. And the entire table groaned and slapped their foreheads, because imagine... You walk up, somebody walks up to you and goes, yeah, we should hang out because I can craft flesh and bone. They are the scariest person in the universe to you. <laughs> so, so this obviously, this did not enamor our group with the Hellions because, I, I, you know, even without with there being, it was the creepiest thing. Like, the creepiest thing that he could have said to anyone at this institute at all. Even if he said, I want to smell you, it wouldn't have been creepier than this, because this was Hannibal Lecter shit. He didn't realize it, but it was. So, it, um, it also, also, it took a second, but, uh, Hellion, one of the, uh, one of the leader of the Hellions, yes, he is Hellion and the Hellions, he immediately realizes that Warwick is using metal sense to realize that she's completely Mercury, and he points out that that means that I can see through her clothes. So that made everything much, much nicer. So we we immediately had... We replaced the New Mutants in terms of having a rivalry with the Hellions. The Hellions still antagonized the New Mutants, but in the story that we were there, we were the bigger issue. Because we already had that run-in where Warwick said the exact dumbest thing. Which... I think it's really interesting because it was my fault. It wasn't a scripted event or anything, or it wasn't planned by the, the GM. It was just because one PC did something really dumb, and that's how a lot of things happen with us. Especially, like, Tia going off um, on her own, trying to be in, Miss Independent, or being a little Miss Berserker. That, that pushed a lot of stuff. So, the... It's we we originally started and it felt like we were just follow, kind of following the comic with a very cool extras to it because uh, one of the things is we had a science teacher who wasn't in the comics who was this dude who one of our challenges he had to fight a monster that he grew out of of a capsule in the in the in the pool in the backyard like, the backyard of the Xavier Institute. He grew a horrible, tentacled monster that we had to fight, and we were timed and judged on style of fighting. So that was awesome. Until. See, the thing about um, the Academy X books, before they became Academy X, they were just New Mutants Volume 4, was that there was a mandate that the kids were not going to fight supervillains. Which was a pretty good idea when we first do the early thing. That was, um... That's also how the new Miss Marvel series did its first couple of issues. There weren't superhero, super villains. It was just a kid with superpowers trying to figure them out, which is a good idea. But eventually you need supervillains, especially when you're playing a superhero game. So, a few nights after this really awesome thing with the science teacher, the science teacher asked to see Tia. And he puts a mind whammy on her. And she wakes up in a tube being bonded with adamantium. 
turns out our science teacher was a shape-shifted Mr. Sinister. Yes, um, if you're not familiar with Marvel Comics, Mr. Sinister is a mad geneticist. And he has a lot of complicated powers, but but yes, he, he was shape-shifted and hiding at our school trying to find proper genetic stock, and one of his big obsessions is Jean Grey, and guess who was an alternate dimension uh, child of Jean Grey? Yeah, poor Tia. She gets modded with adamantium and goes nuts. She rampages through the, um, through the Institute, and she actually... This was an interesting uh, bit. When she rampages through the Institute, some of the staff tries to stop her, and one of the staff, and I always thought this was a kind of an odd choice. One of the staff that tried to stop her was Mero. I guess maybe they brought Mero in because this was a character that also had regeneration. Yeah, not so much with Tia around. Tia goes berserker baby phoenix on her and cuts her goddamn head off. She, she killed one of the teachers and staff. Um, and we we all kind of get the alert, and we... She's She's just going into random rooms and like, like she's trying to uh, she's trying to find Wolverine is the thing. She wants somebody to comfort her, I think. So she ends up in Cecily Kincaid Trump and slashes her up, which is once again this is a testament to how badass the adamantium is when they were using the Euro system. She slashes up a girl made of liquid metal and it really hurts her. It, about that time, we reach her, and uh, Tikion stuns her, stuns her with a lightning bolt. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, we, we are, we're trying. We're tr- I've got her bound up in in the tentacles, and she's trying to trying to rage her way out. And she's starting to flicker like with Phoenix Force. We didn't even know what was going on. We knew some bad shit was happening. She's flickering with Phoenix Force, but we do manage to get her calmed down. And this is when, um, this was another big moment for, for Warwick as a character. We're trying to get her calmed down, and Warwick is, gets his metal sense, and he realizes that, that Cecily is seriously, grievously injured. She is messed up from the adamantium, and I'm like, okay, GM, I have all this metal control stuff. She is made of metal. Can I heal her? And it was a heroic resolve thing, but it was also showing that the character actually does think about things. Like, in the thick of things. When he, when he goes into hero mode, it's sort of like Darkwing Duck, let's get dangerous. So, and it's, let's get smart. So Warwick thinks about this, and he's like, can I heal her? And Jam goes, okay, um, roll it. So I roll it, and I manage to put her back together, because she got seriously messed up. She was cut into shreds that she couldn't bring her, pull herself back together. So, we fix her, we get Tia calmed down, we find out all the aftermath, and like everybody is completely freaked out and traumatized. Because like I said, she did kill one of the teachers. One of the staff members. I don't know if, I don't know if Mero was an actual teacher. I don't think Mero could be a teacher if if you don't know X-Men, and hell, if you do know X-Men, you may not know Mero. Mero was somebody that could grow bone out of their bodies, and she she was a... Uh, she was like one of the Morlocks from the future, and she was kind of a feral character, so I don't think she was an actual teacher, but she was on staff, possibly for trying to stop... being there to stop Tia, which, you know, that helped so much. So, um, we get things quiet down, and they're, they're trying to, they, they actually do this sort of Batman Begins things, where they say Logan is the one that killed Mero by mistake, because they don't want people stigmatizing Tia. But the Hellions know, so our characters realize that, well, a lot of the Hellions are dicks, specifically Hellions, so... We need to tell them not to tell anybody about what Tia did. We're, we're, we're terrified of that. So we go and we try to explain, and lo and behold, Mercury, Cecily, is the one that sticks up for us. And she's like, 
yeah, she she was not in control. There was something wrong with her, and she was attacked by Sinister. And then she, um, when this is all said and done, and everybody's leaving, she gives Warwick a kiss on the cheek, and that starts her whole relationship arc, which I thought was really cute. And uh, I give a couple of homages to it in the Descendant series. Um, Warwick at one point has a dream where Tank is melting into a puddle of mercury, and then later we have. Uh, <laughs> Then we ha- have Tank actually with with uh, silver body paint on, so so I I had a lot of fun with that, and they were very cute together, just adorable. I I did that again. I did the Soul game with uh, Pele for a Marvel game, and uh, I reprised that relationship there without the the mind control that I mentioned in uh, in the in the uh, Dungeon War, uh, RPG War Stories. So, but beyond that, we, after that, it stopped being about a school thing because, because other things started happening. Sentinels started attacking mutants and the X-Men had to, had to go and stop that and then they had to go into space. And at that point, Sentinels attacked the school and we got split up. And uh, at one point, we were we were trying to uh, find. We were spending time in Wakanda. And at what at another point, we had I can't remember who exactly we saved, but we saved somebody so well that they set us up in this awesome island resort for a vacation. And then we were attacked by a giant Cthulhuid sea monster, which we defeated by using at the time Danny's Dark Force thing she started being able to drain energy from things and then to put energy, dark energy, back into people, which would supercharge their powers. So, we ended up beating this thing that attacked, like, there were thousands of people on this island. It was sort of like Jurassic World. This thing comes up out of the ocean, and it's hungry, and and Danny charges us all up with super-powered evil sides to kick its ass. Like, I, I melted the monorail system in, into chains, and TK was electrifying the chains, and Tia was going full-on Phoenix on this thing. It was amazing. We had... This game had everything, and, and it had that mind-control plot that I've already talked about on the blog. It showed the real potential of having these teenage characters, because they still had their teenage issues, even when they were out of school and doing the the globe-hopping thing. They still had to work with each other. They still fought. TK and and Warwick were still, like, doing the the bro-bickering thing, and and Danny was still trying to be Miss Popular, even even though it was becoming more and more obvious that she was starting to stand out, which isn't good for popularity when you're when you're clearly different, even if it's a good different. So so we were all trying we were we were playing these characters that weren't pure heroes, but they were heroes. And and I think it was a very nice touch that we each influenced each other as we did things because Warwick was always like we have to help people, we have to do things and TK was like but we have to use good tactics and think things through before we do before we do them. And Danny eventually understood her role, and she was an amazing shock troop. She um, hero does these things called move bys and move throughs, where you use your base speed, and you can hit somebody with your base speed. It hurts you back, but we got around that by making her this badass shield that absorbs move through uh, damage back. So she was this badass shop troop, and Tia was, well, Tia was Tia was sort of our plot generator because Tia always got into stuff or had people after her. But Tia always helped out. Tia was especially if we needed something destroyed, we pointed her at it, and she would just go go to town on it, which was very funny because she start she also started to she was a lot younger than us. She was like thirteen. And as she grew up in the context of the game, she started to realize, like, 
for one thing, she is never going to actually grow up because she has the adamantium bonded to her now. And uh, there were some great uh, Big Daddy Wolverine moments, including including when she first got bonded with the adamantium. And what happened, how she got bonded with the adamantium is because Sinister took Warwick over. I forgot to mention that. Sinister took Warwick over and gave him this crap that superpowered him to the point that he could tr- control adamantium. So Warwick was the one that bonded the adamantium to Tia. And Wolverine... Wolverine played living lie detectors like, did you do it on purpose, bub? So, so Warwick was a, terrified of Wolverine forevermore, which was hilarious because Wolverine was one of his favorites before the whole thing started. But, yeah, this, it was a singular game from my career that I will always remember fondly. I, I remember several games like that, that, that our group works worked really well together. We we were very into player generated plot. Um, that the Marvel game, the Faresh's Absadia game, my original era campaign, it was all about our group working together to tell these amazing stories, and it it, it really solidified to me what RPGs could be. You didn't have to be about the hack and slash action. It wasn't about the players versus the DM. It was about cooperative storytelling at its best. It was about making something bigger because you cannot control what others do. When other people do something, you roll with it, your character reacts to it, and that's how you get the game. I mean... Warwick would not have been the character that he became um, if not for Danny and Tikion and Tia. Like, he very much got his big brother instinct. And I decided to give Warwick a sister, which in Hero System is actually, you take a disadvantage to say you have family. Because your family can be attacked, so you take a disadvantage for it, which is cool. But Warwick got a sister because... I realized he had such a big brother instinct for having Tia around. Um, So a lot of stuff came out of the fact that other players made their decisions, and then I was playing off of it. And they were playing off of things I did, like causing the Hellions thing. And at one point, Warwick uh, built a car, and it accidentally became sentient because of the metal elemental thing that he had. So... He also ended up having this kind of big brother instinct for the car, and we we ended up building a device to let the car project itself. And that the car projecting itself and then acting like a little sister is when you read Imago, that's where Phoebe came from. Uh, so, and in fact, I think the car's name was Phoebe. So, th- that's that's really what what I want to leave you with is because th- this game taught me so much about the great parts of superheroes and the team hero genre in general. It taught me it taught me how to tell that story, the importance of these things, the 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 death of Mero. It 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 was different from the comic book de- deaths, what I call the lull deaths. It wasn't a lull death. It was something that had impact, that re- that actually changed the game. Tia never got over the fact that she killed Mero. Like, not ever. I, th- I think Mero was eventually resurrected because co- comic books, of course she was resurrected. But Tia never went near her ever again. She She was afraid to go in the same building as her. And it was, it, it had a point. It the characters were changed by these things, and that is that is the storytelling that that I hold dear. And I I hope that my readers, you guys listening, I hope that's something that that you've come to hold dear, or that you held dear before you arrived at, at my work. So. Yeah, that is the Marvel game, and that is where Warwick came from. That is where the superhero, the the Descendants universe came from. 
because of Warwick's existence and because it got me back into comics. What happened, and I think I, I've told this story many, many times, but I'll tell it here just in the last few minutes that I have here. Um, what happened was that Academy X got new writers just as Marvel had um, two events, two main events. They had an event called Decimation, where most mutants were depowered, and that that annoyed me to no end, because, of course, the kids being new characters that no one cared about, of course most of them got depowered. You know, thank God, like, Hellion and Mercury, and uh, they didn't get depowered, but so many of the great characters from Academy X got depowered, and many of them killed because the new writers were goddamn children. But the, 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 the true ugliness of Decimation was it was just there to get the X-Men out of the way so they could have their Civil War event. Civil War was the whole thing where all superheroes were going to have to be registered, and some superheroes said, you know what, you've tried this before with the mutants, and it was a really stupid idea, so no. And then the other heroes were like, well, I clearly don't remember any of the bad parts of that, so I'm going to go yes. And, and it was... No one was acting in character. None of the... There were so many deaths, and none of them really mattered. And it felt a lot like people were banging action figures together. And meanwhile, my teen heroes were... They were still there, but they were being culled. Like, literally culled. The, the writers from that book said, we didn't know what to do with all the extra kids, so we just killed them all. So, so they were gotten rid of just for completely crass reasons, and and that was the point the point where I said, you know what, I can do better than this. I am a writer. I, I, I like to tell stories. I think I can do better. I know these are professionals, but I think I can do better. And that is where the Descendants came from. It came from the love of the medium and the characters that I gained from the Marvel game. And the need to preserve that type of story and that type of character characterization when the other when the professionals were not doing it when they had no interest in it so that's what I, that's what I did that is that is the descendants and that is why it was important for me to tell you about the marvel game because the marvel game is where it all came from the marvel game was an important turning point and and really, I, I I have to thank the GM for for everything that's come after because creating the descendants is what gave me this career that I have that that made so much possible. This, the awesome people that I've met, many of them who are you guys here, um, the industry I've be, I've become part of, the Pen and Cape Society, um, all of it was because of the Marvel game. And it's something, it's one of those influences that I want to hold up and hold dear and let, and share with other people because it was great. It was amazing. I, I hope that any one of you who listens to this, who role plays, I hope that you get to play in a game that is as fun as this was, as important to you as this was to me. Because it it was major. It was something that I I we've the solo game, the solo Marvel game, and I'll get into that some other time. And Absadia, I'll get into that some other time. They were also very important to me, but they were not as long reaching and major as the Marvel game. But role role playing, it's a game. It's fun. But it can it can do, do some powerful things, and I think people don't realize that. People don't appreciate it. They think, oh, it's it's just like sports for nerds. But no, it's it's something way more powerful, uh, way greater than that, and it deserves respect. And it deserves to be it. You know, play for fun, play for drama and story, play for all of it. Just play. I am Landon Porter, and this has been the fifth week event, episode three.